in the previous lessons we explored some of the common data types defined by the Swift standard library. Today we continue that exploration by taking a close look at collection types. The Swift standard library defines three collection types. Arrays, sets and dictionaries. While each collection type has a unique set of features, the collection types of Swift's standard library also have a few things in common. The values and keys stored by arrays, sets and dictionaries are strictly typed. For example, you cannot insert an integer into an array of strings. If you're used to weakly typed languages, then you may consider this a major limitation. The benefits, however, far outweigh those limitations. When working with collections in Swift, you always know what to expect. And that is a significant benefit that results in a more robust code base. Arrays are probably the most common collection type. An array is ordered and stores a collection of values. As I mentioned earlier, the values stored in an array are of the same type. Working with arrays is easy. There are several ways to instantiate an array. In this example, we create an array, fruits, using an initializer. We append a pair of parentheses to the shorthand form of the array's type. This example is equivalent to the following. While it's fine to use this approach, it's recommended to use the shorthand form. It improves readability and is less verbose. Most programming languages support literals and Swift is no different. You can instantiate an array with an array literal. In this example we create the fruits array using an array literal with three elements. There's no need to specify the type of the array. The compiler can infer the type by inspecting the values of the array literal. Under the hood an array is a structure. We discuss structures later in this series. Structures have properties and methods. You can ask an array for the number of elements it contains by inspecting the value of its count property. Arrays also have an isEmpty property. This is similar to asking an array whether it has any elements. Do you remember the var and let keywords from earlier in the series? They also determine the mutability of collections. Let me illustrate this with an example. If you declare an array using the var keyword, that array is mutable. This means that you can add and remove elements from the array. In this example we declare an empty array, colors. The array is mutable because we use the var keyword to declare the array. Because the array is mutable, we can add and remove elements from the array. We use the append method to add an item to the array. And since arrays are ordered collections, we can also insert elements at a specific index using the insert at method. Removing elements from an array is similar. We invoke the remove at method and pass the index of the element we wish to remove. The remove at method returns the element that was removed. The remove all method removes every element from the array. Earlier we declared the fruits array using the let keyword. If we try to add or remove an element from the array, the compiler throws an error at us, because fruits is immutable. It cannot be modified. You already know how to add and remove items from an array. To access the value stored at a particular index, you can use subscript syntax. The syntax should look familiar if you have experience with other programming languages. You can also use subscript syntax to update a value at a particular index. Be careful though, if the index is outside the array's existing bounds, a runtime error is thrown. You can access every element of an array using a for in loop. If you're only interested in the elements of the array, the for in loop looks like this. There's no need to specify the type of vegetable, since the compiler knows vegetables stores a collection of string values. Sets and arrays have several features in common. They both store a collection of values of the same type. You can add and remove elements from mutable sets and arrays. 
but there are some obvious differences. A set is unordered and each element can only appear once in a set. While an array can contain duplicate elements, each value contained in a set is unique. To accomplish this, the values stored in a set need to conform to the hashable protocol. We discuss protocols later in this series. For now, remember that a type that conforms to the hashable protocol has a hash value that the set uses to uniquely identify it. That is how a set can guarantee that every element only appears once in the set. The initialization of a set is a bit more verbose than that of an array because there is no literal syntax available for sets. In this example we create a set of string values. You can also use an array literal to instantiate a set with zero or more values. Because the compiler can infer the type of the set, by inspecting the values of the array literal, we don't need to specify the type of the set we are creating. The methods and properties of a set are similar to those of an array. A set also defines a count and an isEmpty property. Adding and removing elements is slightly different. Because sets are unordered, the methods to add and remove items look a bit different. The remove method returns the value that was removed. If we try to remove a value that doesn't exist, the method returns null. Iterating over the values of a set is identical to iterating over the values stored in an array. What makes sets unique and powerful is the ability to perform operations on sets. In this example we define two sets. The sets contain the Twitter handles of the people John and Anna follow on Twitter. We can create a third set that combines both sets using the union method. Notice that the union constant only contains unique values, no duplicates. We can use the intersection method to determine which followers John and Anna have in common. There are several other operations such as symmetric difference and subtraction. The symmetric difference method is the opposite of the intersection method. It creates a set that contains the values unique to each set. As the name implies, the subtracting method removes the values of one set from another set. I really enjoy using sets because of their unique traits. And for some tasks they are more performant than arrays. Dictionaries store an unordered collection of key value pairs. The key type of a dictionary must conform to the hashable protocol because the dictionary needs to be able to uniquely identify each key. Even though dictionaries are quite different from sets and arrays, there are some similarities. Like sets, dictionaries are unordered and, like arrays, a dictionary can contain duplicate values. The keys of a dictionary are unique though. You can instantiate a dictionary one of several ways. In this example, we define a dictionary, stocks, using an initializer. We append a pair of parentheses to the shorthand form of the dictionary's type. While this is equivalent to the following example, I'm sure you agree that the shorthand form is more readable and more concise. We can also use a dictionary literal to create a dictionary. The key value pairs are wrapped in a pair of brackets and separated by commas. The key and value of each key value pair are separated by a colon. The compiler infers the type of the dictionary by inspecting the types of the keys and values of the dictionary literal. Because we're already familiar with sets and arrays, working with dictionaries is straightforward. We can ask the dictionary for the number of key value pairs it stores by inspecting the value of its count property. And the dictionary also defines an isEmpty property. You can also access the keys and values of a dictionary through its keys and values properties. We have several options to work with key value pairs stored in a dictionary. The most convenient option is subscript syntax. But dictionaries also define a few methods for manipulating the key value pairs they store. The update value for key method adds or updates the value of a particular key. 
If the specified key doesn't exist, the key value pair is added. If the specified key does exist, the corresponding value is updated. The update value for key method has a subtle advantage over subscript syntax. It returns the old value for the specified key. If you add a new key value pair, the method returns nil, because there is no old value. Dictionaries also define a method for removing key value pairs, remove value for key, and a method to remove every key value pair of the dictionary, remove all. Iterating over the contents of a dictionary is similar to iterating over the values of an array or a set. The difference is that a tuple is returned for every key value pair of the dictionary. As a Swift developer, array sets and dictionaries are constructs you use every single day. They are lightweight and easy to use, but powerful and versatile. The next two lessons focus on control flow. We discuss if statements, for in loops and the power of the switch statement. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below or reach out to me on Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe if you want to learn more about Swift and Cocoa development.